Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of the Richard Urban Show. I'm your host, Richard Urban, reporting from Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. We bring you news and views from God's point of view. Today, we're very happy to have Fuku on. She is a podcaster, and I'm sure she'll introduce herself more. She does a podcast called Refocus, Loving God, Loving People. And we're very happy to have her on as our guest today. So please introduce yourself. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Richard, for having me. It's such a privilege to be on your show. My name is Cuckoo, and um, I'm a podcaster, like he's already said. I'm also um, wrapping up my master thesis. I'm a biologist as well. So um, I think that's about it. Yeah. And I love God and I love people. So it's really exciting to be here. Okay. That's great. So We've had a few guests on, if you've been uh, listening to the show, we've been talking about why absence matters. In fact, this, I think, would be the seventh show. We had a series and some guests on, and we had some really good discussion. So we're trying to, like, um, just talk about this really, really, really important topic, you know, and talk about, like, why does absence, that mean, meaning sexual absence for marriage, matter? And, you know... Even is that a realistic standard in today's world? So what do you, what do you think about that? Oof, yeah, so I feel like in today's world, it is realistic. However, it's difficult. It's not very easy. We live in a very hyper-sexualized society. So, I mean, the things I didn't think or I'll be exposed to at 12, at 10, at 13, what, at those kind of ages we have, young children who are exposed to these things. Um, now, a days, very young people are already sexually active, even before it's sort of legal, before they understand their bodies, before they understand consent. Um, sex is pushed, is marketed in the media, on the TV, on the internet. So I feel like in this world, uh, people will often look at you as sort of old school and like, come on, like you're not current enough because like I said earlier, the society is hyper-sexualized, but I think it is possible. I think if people have a better understanding, I'm so big on truly understanding something for yourself. I think you'll be able to realize that it's maybe difficult, especially in this world, but I think it is possible. It's realistic. I don't know. I think... I can't say it's unrealistic because it's possible, but at the same time, I don't want to say it's realistic because it's, I don't, I think it's rare to see people still very much abstain today. I don't think people know that that's an option, you know? Yeah. Well, interestingly, so, I mean, that's one thing, you know, um, like here in the U.S. and I don't know about other countries, probably similar, like it used to be even, um, I'd say two decades ago, you know, there were like federal standards, like for um, if they funded uh, sexual health education, that absence is the expected standard for school aged children, which um, many curriculums, like I was working in DC, and even that they tried to take it out of the curriculum, but we actually had them keep it in. So we, we got some ground, gains, or not gain ground, but didn't lose ground. Point being, I mean, if you don't even know that's a standard, isn't that really doing a disservice to our youth? Just kind of like throwing anything out there, like use contraception, Definitely. you know, do whatever you want. Isn't that really a disservice to young people? What do you think? Um, I think I think it's a disservice, definitely, because it's very, very, it's very unfair. But I, I think everything as well just comes with understanding. We live in a world where gradually, and, and I remember posting something and somebody said, we have changed the labels of things so that we, it evades guilt, you know, and it evades all of that. And I think this is something that we see in our society today, that people are changing things and shaking up things, you know, and saying, oh, you know what, I mean, you can do this, it's not that bad. You know, it's not, I mean, everybody does it. You're a human being. They tell you, oh, you'll be sexually liberated. You need to understand your body. You need to explore your body. And in this, in this way, in fact, right before this, I was just listening to 
a podcast on a lady who was saying, oh, she actually teaches kids that, you know, and, and young people to explore their bodies before marriage, you know, and it's, it's sort of like there is sexual liberation where people, I believe everyone should be thought about their bodies, but I don't think we should be encouraging people to indulge in um, sexual activity because it's normal, because their body needs it, you know? All of us need stuff, all of us need money, but we don't go robbing the bank to fill that desire. What do we do? We work, even though it's not the most desirable job, but we work hard to get what we right. want. So just because something, I think many pe people push this because they think this is normal, this is natural, this is their bodies, they should explore, they should do. However, it's unfair because they should also be taught to gain mastery of their desires. And I think this is what people don't speak a lot. I was listening to a, a sermon who said, and a pastor was basically saying, when you're someone who you're so used to sleeping around, you're practicing yourself and that's the standard, that's the norm. Marriage is not going to change that. You will still sleep around. It's not going to curb your behavior or your sexuality. Right. Because you've been taught to explore and just let loose your natural desires instead of being taught to tame it. I think it really, really, really does damage. I mean, when we're talking from unwanted pregnancies, we're talking STDs, we're talking the guilt and the trauma after abortion, it is countless. But it's such a big disservice that people are not pushing abstinence as much as they are pushing condoms, you know? Yeah. I agree. I agree. And you were talking about, you know, some of the reasons why it's good to abstain. I think there are mar probably married reasons for people of faith and Christians and other people of faith. Probably that's a really uh, big one. And uh, in other words, that you should abstain. But all that being said, you know, shouldn't like abstinence be the uh, before marriage be the standard like for christian courtship or dating or what do you think and is it really or is that really a big problem within those who you know are professing faith or in the church or whatever well I, I strongly believe that um god is perfect and only god can say who is eventually you know doing the most perfect thing i don't know if who is more righteous who has a better right only god knows that we have a bible We've got guidelines. And I think for the longest time, people talk about Christianity in such a manner, like we are just a bunch of yes ma'ams and yes sirs. We just do, 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 but we have no understanding. When we're told to abstain, it's because we're not doing it for God. We're not doing God a favor. We're doing ourselves a favor. But if we don't see it as that, it's difficult to do so. I strongly believe that abstinence should definitely be a standard for Christian relationships because I feel like more than anything, before you get into it, lust is a very big thing a lot of young people struggle with. Sexual immorality is a very, very, very big issue, you know? And it's something that, like, you find, that's why you find people, even when they're married, they're still very much into porn. They're still very much cheating on their partners. They're still very much lustful. Abstinence trains you to curb those desires. It trains you to master it. So the truth is that Christians will feel, you know, um, sexually um, trying to, you know, censor the language because we're human, we're not dead. So those needs and those sexual needs right. and those desires will be there but i think it's very important as a christian that we have that self-control and we are trained to gain mastery of it it's sort of like fasting basically mm -hmm. now it's very difficult for a lot of people to fast but someone once said if you can definitely if you can fast then you you can discipline yourself because if you can control what goes into your body then you definitely you you you've reached basically the pinnacle of discipline and you see this with bodybuilders as well. You see this with athletes as well. These people want to have cheeseburgers and fries. They want to have Coke, you know, but they right. know exactly what they want and where they are headed. So I think it's very, very important for a Christian. I, I don't think this, uh, if, I, if, I, if I got your question correctly, I think this is a very, very important standard when it comes to Christian, because if anything, it reflects self-control, which is a fruit of the spirit. Well, right. You know? yeah, yeah, and I was, you know, thinking about 
statistics like that say, I don't know about sexual activity per se, but even like things like divorce among people who are, you know, defining themselves as Christian isn't all that much different percentage than other people. So maybe I'm thinking, well, we're perhaps having a crisis. Maybe this factor isn't being taught enough, isn't really uh, coming across among God's people, something like that. Definitely. I think definitely it is, it is very alarming, actually, because the world looks at you as a standard. You say you're a Christian, your life should clearly show a difference. Now, not because, it's not because we're Christian, we're immune to terrible things that happen in this world. You know, so you have Christians who fall sick, who get diagnosed with cancer, who are hit by drunk drivers. We are not in some, I don't know, bubble that is just different. Right. We go through life like everyone else. But we, because we have a deeper understanding and we have a relationship with God, this should reflect so what are we seeing in a lot of homes is that a lot of people, and this is something that I had to like sort of learn, and I just hope I'm not diverging, is that no, go ahead. sometimes we are thought about, you know, marriage and stuff like this, but it's not, you don't really find a lot of the times churches just say, okay, you know what, be abstinent, be abstinent, be abstinent, but they're not teaching young people how to live lives that are holy that are sexually pure the focus is so much on the consequence you're going to fall pregnant you're going to disappoint god you're going to go to hell i don't know you know I and mean, we push all of this and a lot of young people are growing up but there's no training i know a lot of churches have the premarital counseling but how about marital counseling when they are in the marriage is a leader is a spiritual leader still speaking into their lives is a spiritual leader still speaking into their marriage. I'm very big on therapy, even though I'm a Christian, you know, because I strongly believe, I, mean, I know that the Holy Spirit is sufficient and I have a relationship with God, but I know that I am my partner. We are different. We're from different backgrounds. We both come from, we have different things to deal with and we need people who understand. So of course there will be spiritual guidance that was, we, we're not just going to do counseling before the marriage. We're not going to wait till disaster strikes. I know I've once we said a doctor who said, come for your checkup cuckoo at least once a month initially i thought oh he just wanted my money but it makes sense to prepare yourself live right eat right exercise not to wait till you're sick because i right. think a lot of people do that they wait and then you want to do damage control and now you want to, to go to therapy now you want to go to church now you want to invite the pastor to pray over the marriage when it's literally ashes and dust so I think a lot of the times, firstly, I think the church needs to do a lot about teaching young people how to maintain relationship. It's not just about having a fly house and having sex, because a lot of Christians do that as well. Oh, they said we shouldn't have sex. Let's get married so we can have sex. But marriage is more than that. It's a freaking lifetime commitment. And people need to understand these things. Couples need to be encouraged to go for therapy and counseling where you have spiritual guidance you have emotional intelligence and um, professionals who know and who can help walk through your issues not to wait to till all of this happens because i feel like we we need to be different we really need to be different mm -hmm. because we think just because we're christians we don't need to put in the work we can just go yeah. in front of them, get married go for premarital counseling and that's it no we need to put in work each and every day yeah, when there's one um, program called Marriage Savers where they have mentor couples in different churches and they're able to help a lot of marriages, you know, save marriages, but also that I think that could be applied just to general, to mentoring and helping uh, other couples, you know. Definitely, definitely. I think that's very important too. Yeah. Well, what about the idea of, like, that's, I guess we've, covered it indirectly but to talk about directly you know cohabitation is so common today yeah. what about that is that really i mean we've already said really no that's not proper because if you're talking about staining then how are you yeah. going to cohabit but anyway yeah. could you kind of address that for a minute you know so i was raised in a very traditional christian home and it was not even an option it's like it's not happening However, when I traveled, I started getting, you know, exposed to different lives, different cultures, different standards. I was like, oh, I mean, it's not such a bad thing. But then I was like, 
like you just said, how are you going to be abstinent? If it's like walking into a lion's den, you know, you don't put yourself. And I think this is something that I had to learn. We as human beings, we tend to overtrust ourselves. You don't do that. You don't put yourself in a situation. If you know yourself, you know, you know how your body works, you know, okay, rather than having sleepovers, let's have brunch dates, you know? So I think it's very, very important to sort of really establish that. But back to what you were saying, cohabiting is very, very controversial. There are people who believe that it's very important that I know how this person lives. Before I, because the truth is, you can think you know a person, but when you live with them, it's like, oh my goodness. I don't know if you've ever had a friend or someone you knew so well, and then they visited you for a week and you were barely, you barely made it till the end. Maybe they are very messy. Maybe they are very particular about how they want their house to be done. And people can, like I say this oftentimes, we can come up with several reasons to justify these things. However, this, I don't think, of course, there's no passage in the Bible that says don't cohabit. But I think when you're already trying to share that very personal, intimate space with someone, it will most likely lead to sexual intercourse and therefore defeats abstinence. So I don't think um, I don't think it's something that I would do or I would recommend. There's people who will be like, oh no, we're not having sex. We're just living together. I just and if, or some people will tell you, oh we You really know some couples like that? For real? Yes, I, for real. There's people who will tell you <laughs> It sounds like uh, that's a rather bad plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so serious. And then you have people who say, oh, we are engaged. We're going to get married eventually, you know, but it, you've still not made this commitment, you know, like official. So even though, and some people think of, I mean, it's like walking into a marriage blindly. And that's some people's excuse for having sex before marriage because they were like, they want to know, does this person know me? The, you know, what's this person? Does, do they have a fetish? Am I, do, will they be able to satisfy me? I don't think that is the primary goal we should have when you're getting into a relationship because a person can learn all of that. They can well, learn. I agree. I mean, yeah. the com- I think the, the commitment factor is so big. And also you have the, the marriage should be centered on God substantially. So yeah. you should have this commitment to your spouse. So I think this kind of like modern day thing where you have like kind of one foot in, one foot out, I think that's really self-defeating. It's really wrong. That's my opinion. What do you think? Definitely. Because I think it's, it's, it's a thing of, like you said, God should be the standard. He should be the center. And marriage is not a transaction when you're going in for what you stand to gain. Like, will I be sexually satisfied? Will I be financially satisfied? It's not, it's not that. You're basically coming to the table. It's more than, it's more than taking. It's about giving. And that's why you find a lot of relationships that just don't work because two people want to come and take and then they live broken and dry and empty instead of coming to give, you know? And honestly speaking, like, like I, I always say this, we often come up with excuses to justify it. Just the same way, for example, if I've been celibate for 23 years, why would I go and cheat on my husband? when I've been able to, because this is training and people don't see it as that. I'm training myself to learn how to deal and not satisfy, you know, um, you know, like sexual urges and all of that, you know? So I think it's very, very important that, like you said, people need to realize that, that God is at the standard and every other thing and every other excuse, you'll get to know that you have forever. And it's crazy because you're going to be married to this person, hopefully forever. And you want to live with them now. No, you're going to be living with them. So I think it's, it's a, I'm going, and it's a very big decision as well to go and be vulnerable and be open and to live and to share. Marriage is a very big deal. And I think, think people don't think about this a lot. People think, oh, it's going to be better if I can test drive, test drive, test drive, test, just, you know, let me just make sure, you know, and it's not that. You're just leaping and you're hoping that when you leap, someone is going to catch you. You know, but right. I think- yeah. yeah, I've been married 38 years, thank God. So, yeah, I mean, it's a commitment. Definitely. Definitely, you're growing together. There's definitely ups and downs, but yeah. And um, yeah, I do believe in eternal marriage. In, in our faith tradition, you know, we believe that marriage is eternal. 
you know, not only on this earth. So um, not only till death do us part. Wow. Well, this has been a really good discussion. Um, yeah. Did you have any more thoughts before we like wrap it up that you want to share on yeah. that, on the topic, like why absence matters? Um, just, just to conclude, I think it's just very important for a lot of Christians to realize two things. You're not doing it for God and you're not doing it. You're not, you're not doing God a favor because some people think, oh, I'm going to do this. And therefore, because I'm abstinent, God must bless me with a big husband, a rich husband, a great man. No, you're not doing that. Abstinence is more about you. In fact, everything that God asks us to do is more about us than is about him. God doesn't get anything, anything from you choosing to close your legs, but you get the peace, you get the sanity, you don't have problems with soul ties, you don't have problems freaking out with pregnancies, you don't have problems with STDs, it's all about you. So the moment people begin to realize that a lot of things that God asks us to do is not about him, I think then it becomes easier and really having an understanding. People don't, be, nobody wants to ruin your life. Sex is beautiful, but it's a flame. And if it's not contained, it will destroy. And dealing with lust, dealing with porn is something that you do not want to, if you're already dealing with it, I'm sure you already know the repercussions. So I think it's very important to realize that abstinence in today, it is possible. I always tell people this. There's a particular Bible story where Elijah thinks he's the only one serving God and God opens his eyes to see 7,000 men who hadn't worshipped Baal. But basically, sometimes we think we're the only ones doing it. No, the same way you're standing and you're keeping yourself, thousands. My mom always told, tells me that good men are not finished. They're still there. Just That's the same true. Doing your part. Because society wants to say, oh, every, everything is, it's men are trash, this and this. And it's really crazy because it's not the truth. It's not the truth. So get this understanding for yourself and realize you're doing yourself the favor. It's all about you. Everything you're doing is about you and it will pay off. It is so worth it. What is a few years compared to forever? And it's not like you're going to sleep with the person 247. It's just sex at the end of the day. You know, and it's, I think that's just what I really wanted to share with people. And don't do it and now feel entitled. You don't get a special seat in heaven because you kept your legs closed. You know, so God doesn't want that pride, you know, or, or I'm doing this. I've never smoked before. I've never drank before. And no, no, no. You're not better than anyone else, you know. So do it with a good heart, understand it. And this understanding makes it easier. It makes it easier to abstain. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. It was such a pleasure. Yeah. Hopefully you'll uh, continue the conversation. Um, yeah, I'm very happy you could come on today. This has been a, a great series of seven parts, like why absence matters. So I do thank you for listening today. Thank you, Cuckoo. Uh, you can catch our podcast, Refocus Loving God, Loving People, on your favorite uh, podcast platform. I'm your host, Rich Urban, coming to you from Historic Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Do be blessed and good afternoon.